The first ever ascent in a hydrogen balloon happened in 1738. It was piloted by Dr. J.A. Charles. And he said about that flight, he described it, when I felt myself lifting off the earth, I didn't have a feeling of euphoria. I had a feeling of happiness. He described it as a moral feeling, one in which as he left the earth, he could feel himself living, so to speak. My first journey, heavenward, was not nearly as profound, poetic, or lyrical as that of Dr. Charles. In fact, it was more akin to an aerial somersault. I alternated, I remember vividly, between feelings of terror and exhilaration. At the tender age of nine, it was a typical Sunday morning. In our household of seven kids, it was always a bit chaotic with a lot of energy. As mom roused us, tried to feed us breakfast, and assemble us into a presentable package for church. As was often our custom in the summertime, we would, our tradition in our family was to have a tailgate party after church. We, Dad would find a place that would be of interest to our kids, to all of us kids, and we would arrive at the destination ready to play and explore. On this particular Sunday, the destination was a small airport in the Midwest. And as we piled out of the car and began to play, mom was assembling the sandwiches and distributing the lunch. Dad had disappeared for a while. And when he returned, he informed me that he had purchased a flight scene tour, my first one ever. So as we walked into the airport, I saw this tiny Cessna 172 airplane sitting on the ramp. And as we got closer, what I noticed was how weak and small and fragile that door seemed. I only had the perspective of the door of the car, which was heavy and sturdy. The pilot helped me into the aircraft, and he strapped me in with both a lap belt and a shoulder harness. So now my mind was screaming caution. <laughs> as the aircraft engine became alive, I literally dug my fingers into the seat cushion just to hang on for dear life. An airplane raced down the runway, and we began to lift off the earth. I pressed my nose as close to the window as I dared because I wanted to see the view. The, my worldview was changing in that moment, and I didn't know how much it would impact me till later on. As the airplane took off and we climbed higher, I looked back at the airport and I could see this long, straight runway. Right next to it was a parallel taxiway and they had neatly spaced interconnecting pieces of pavement in them. This was an order and a, a sense of planning that my nine-year-old brain didn't comprehend. As we climbed higher and higher, everything became smaller and smaller, except I could see more at one time. The world was actually growing bigger. The activity of the cars and the people on the ground reminded me of one of my childhood pleasures, the leisure time of watching ants. You know how you would sit and you could sit for a long time watching them and they never seemed to have a straight destination or knew where they were going, but they marched around in these random trails and we were always guessing what their destination was going to be. True to aviation tradition, my dad made sure that the pilot knew where we lived because it's custom to fly over something you know and something that you're familiar with, which is probably a challenge for a nine-year-old. Our worlds can be pretty small. As we circled our neighborhood at about 2,000 feet, I was awed and a bit perplexed at this view of my world. I was used to it on the ground, and it had, it was late 1960s, and it was one of those suburbs in the Midwest, you know, the homogenized kind that are built into grids, and it stood in contrast, I could see two landscapes. One was that man-built environment. It was a little cold and sterile. It had lines and angles and hard edges. And the other one was the more soft, vibrant, contouring landscape of the natural environment. The one that was the living and breathing ecosystem that we call Mother Earth. I looked at these two perspectives and I thought, my view of the world, I didn't think, but I think now, <laughs> my view of the world, my perspective is changing. 30 years later, well, actually, let me tell you, um, 
Charles Lindbergh once said that life is like a landscape. We live in it, but it's only from the vantage point of distance that we can begin to describe it. To me, that nine-year-old wide-eyed child that I was, the grown woman that I would become, trying to make my way in a man's world, I had no idea how this vantage point of distance was profoundly and unalterably influencing my life. For four decades, the astronauts have traveled to space and to the moon. They all talk about a profound feeling, a new vision that they achieve when they look back and see our tiny planet hanging in space. This has been dubbed the overview effect by a book of the same title from a space philosopher and author named Frank White. He talks of that first-hand experience of first seeing this blue ball hanging into space, into the void of space with this thin layer that protects and nurtures it, a paper-thin layer that we call the atmosphere. They say that this is a profound experience and you can't look at it without understanding a sense of responsibility to this fragile blue planet. In fact, this perspective needs to marshal a society of planetary citizens to help protect this view, this planet we have, our life. An Apollo 14 astronaut, Edgar Mitchell, said that it gave him a feeling of profound interconnectedness. And almost all astronauts describe this view of the planet with a feeling of awe. This is a feeling that I know well. 30 years after my maiden voyage, I set on another personal skyward journey. From my small airport in Arlington, Washington, I set out to acquire my own pilot's license. As I flew over this community that I knew and loved and looked at the landscape, my view again of the world was changing. I was becoming aware of how connected my community was and what part it was of a larger system. It reminded me of when you look, have you ever looked in the back of a fine watch? You know, old style, not the phones we have now, but the old style watches. You'd see, you'd see the gears and the connections, and they moved in sync. It's a series of mechanical components, and when they move together, they power the timepiece. I was becoming aware that my world was more than just this small community that I lived in. As I flew over it, I could see both contrasts. The man-built man environment, the one that was the railroad and the freeways and the power lines, and even the airport that I flew from was once vast farmlands and forest. The community was changing. The man-made environment was bringing change to the community, and it was making way for the community that it would become in the future. It was impossible not to alter your worldview with this experience. As I was learning to fly, I learned to navigate. It's one thing you need to know as a pilot, how to find your way around. I would navigate and chart a course, and I'd follow the landscape to help me find my way out of unfamiliar territory. This same landscape that was helping me find my way in the sky was also helping me keep in sync with my community that I loved on the ground. Ten years later, after flying over this wonderful community, I became the mayor of that small town community. I too was charting my own course of change. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, said, we went to the moon as, human we went to the moon as technicians and we returned as humanitarians. This was never more real to me as a pilot of the skies, a citizen of the earth, and the mayor of Arlington, Washington, than on March 22nd, 2014. The first sound that I became aware of that was different was the sound of sirens. 
So it's a sound a mayor never hears without a little bit of trepidation and sadness creeping into your heart. We heard rumor began to spread that there had been a mudslide on the Valley Highway. We sensed it was something big as the sirens continued to wail in the distance. The thumping of the helicopters overhead gave us a sense of disruption and invasion and chaos all at once. We knew that our world had changed. My, few, my first view of the site from the ground was something that nobody can prepare you for. This beautiful, picturesque valley that had flown over hundreds of times in the past 10 years. It had the kind of beauty in nature that would take your breath away at times. This unadorned beauty, to coin a phrase, would say, make your soul smile. But standing in front of this still landscape, it had morphed into a soul-shattering anguish that was hard to comprehend. It was like a mud-like lava flow had swept over the landscape in the most unimaginable earth flow. This wall of mud had come down and swallowed everything in its path and, split it up and spit it out into a pile of mud and debris. Centuries-old majestic trees had splintered and broke up and they lay like matchsticks across this landscape. It was incomprehensible. And I knew, I perceived in that moment that the lives of the people in the valley in my life had irrevocably changed. What I once knew was no more. It's as simple as that. The lives and the things that connected to them, the things that made up the foundation of who we are, were simply gone. They say that two things happen to people in a natural disaster. The first reaction is shock, and the second one is a rush into action. And we were no different. Townspeople, officials, first responders, we assembled into a coalition that would help the harmed, rescue the stranded, and minister to the dead. The media descended upon our town. They came in mass. They wanted to tell our stories. They wanted to listen. They wanted to learn. We were a community of friends and neighbors and strangers. But at that time, we were united. We were united as people of this planet, and we were united in humanity. I have been blessed to have a lifetime of having a bigger view, of having an alternate view of the universe. <clears throat> I needed, I wanted to fly over this site. I needed to put it into perspective. I wanted to see what the astronauts called the overview effect. I wanted to make sense out of the incomprehensible. For 30 years, this larger view that I have had has brought me a sense of happiness and oneness with the world. It's what can happen when you dare to step outside your own world and to look at things with a different view. Author Richard Bach, also an aviator, who wrote a book about a famous wing aviator, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, <laughs> one of my favorite books. He said, don't believe what your eyes tell you because they only show us limitations. Look with what you know. Sense with what you're aware of. This is how you will learn to fly. He also said that there's a spirit into anything in which we weave our soul. Pilots don't often talk about it, but we think about it in the still quiet of a night flight. 